Okay, we're recording. So here's uh, what we were talking about last time. This is kind of a quick reminder. So we were talking about uh, ultimately this stuff called flux. And so uh, why were we talking about flux? And keep in mind, flux is this expression right here, F dot N times the area A. Okay, so what's the purpose, right? Why are we interested in such an expression? Um, it's because, well, it's because the answer to a natural question, very natural question, uh, which is how fast is water flowing through the surface, given that the fluid is, um, is uh, uh, flowing at a given velocity? Okay, all right. Uh, so uh, what I left as an exercise for... For, for y'all um, is uh, to, to think through how you can make a very similar argument to show another application of flux, and that is flux can be thought of as computing what I'm going to call quantity per unit time instead of, uh, uh, instead of volume per unit time. Right now, this is a little bit different. You know, mass, uh, which you can think is a stand-in for quantity, uh, is not the same as volume. Right. So uh, how would we get a different answer? And the idea is that, uh, well, that's assuming that the vector field is representing the flow in a different way, specifically not giving you velocity of the fluid, but giving you this, uh, you know, at a glance, seemingly uh, weird construction where you multiply the density times the velocity. Uh, odd little construction. Um, but uh, it works, right? And so roughly speaking, the point here is that the density... Um, is uh, going to appear, well, let's see here, let me get, not get out of order. When you ask about mass instead of velocity, then you'll need an extra factor of density here. And then uh, it kind of carries down, and then I'm going to say, loosely speaking, it absorbs into F when you uh, take this last step. Now, those details are an excellent exercise to think through, so I do want you all to think that through uh, on your own. Uh, just make sure you see how this argument adapts to give uh, this answer to that question. And uh, again, really good exercise. Okay, and the last thing we did is we very quickly went through this page, which again, tragically, we just don't really have time for it's super, really too bad because this is a really cool argument and there's some really good intuition to be had here. Um, but uh, you got to recognize sometimes fluids don't have the feature that you can talk about, the velocity of the fluid at a given point. And my favorite example of this is talking about how photons flow, right? If you talk about a light bulb, right? And that's tempting to say, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll model the movement of light by a single light bulb, and all the photons fly out well, in different directions, but all kind of with each other, right? Nearby photons are going basically the same direction. And so it behaves like a more familiar fluid. But if you address the, uh, the much more common scenario of multiple light sources, and just for perspective, there's really multiple light sources in this room, for example. Right? Arguably, the screen itself is a <coughs> whole bunch of different light sources because light's coming off the screen in different locations. So when this thing happens, well, we have to address the fact that the uh, photons are literally going different directions, all at the same point. You can't talk about the velocity at the point. It makes no sense at all. So how would we describe this fluid? And <clears throat> the answer is uh, to take uh, this equation right, that we just got through talking about and to kind of turn it around backwards. And again, I know I'm repeating stuff I've said before. That's why I'm going quickly. Uh, the idea is we used to say, hey, we know what the vector field is, representing velocity or density times velocity, whatever. Um, and we use that to determine the flow rate. And we turn it around backwards in this case and say, hey, suppose we measure the flow rate, <clears throat> right? We just empirically measure these flow rates. Well, then you can ask, you know, can I reverse engineer and find some vector field that makes this formula work? And the answer to that question ends up being yes, by the way. Uh, there's an argument that makes that clear that this is always going to work. Uh, but uh, uh, again, don't have uh, so anyway, the punchline is, even though you can't explicitly define 
velocity or density times velocity because it literally makes no sense. You can still describe those flows with a vector field right? Um, in this way. Okay, and then again, it makes me sad, but I'm sorry. Uh, Y'all probably aren't as sorry as I am, but uh, this example we just don't have time for. It's not officially part of the course. You're not responsible for it. Um, I think it's super cool. I hope you'll take a look at it. You don't have to. It's not going to be on any tests or anything. Okay. All right. Okay, so pick it up from there. So uh, we are going to talk about um, what are called flow lines. This is another really natural idea. And here it goes. Let's suppose you have a water-like fluid or an air-like fluid, something like that. None of this photon business where you know there's no well-defined velocity. Right? So a nice natural fluid. And let's suppose we're representing the flow by way of velocity specifically. Okay. Now let's ask the question now. What would happen if you were to take a particle of some sort, and by particle I mean something that I don't, I don't want to have to worry about gravity. So let's consider it to be of the same exact density as whatever it's floating in. Right? So if we're talking about air, then it's got the same density. It's like a little perfectly weighted balloon. Or if it's water that is our fluid, then uh, we've got something that has the exact density of water. I also don't want to have to worry about momentum issues, you know, uh, inertia and, you know, forces cause an acceleration, but it uh, uh, takes a minute for it to actually get up to speed. I don't want to have to worry about that either, right? So this is basically a massless, uh, perfectly buoyant, imaginary particle. And uh, I drop it into the fluid, and now appeal to intuition. If the water starts going, well, then this particle just goes right along with the fluid, right? So the big think for example, if you have leaves that get dropped onto the surface of a, a little creek or something, well, if the water's going that way. The leaves aren't just going to sit here and maintain their position. No, the leaves go right along with the water, don't they? Right. So that's that's what we're talking about here. That kind of thing. And so, uh, well, they follow the current and trace out some path. So they form a parametric curve. And the question is going to be, given a velocity representing the flow of the fluid, how can you find what are these corresponding curves that are traced out by the particles? All right, so here's uh, my favorite point of view on how to think about it. We'll start with the, the sort of the language down here, which I think is a lot easier to believe, just looking at the language. So um, at any given moment, what's the velocity of the particle? Well, as we just said, the velocity of the particle, it's the velocity of the fluid. It's got to do whatever the fluid does. So the velocity of the particle is the velocity of the fluid. And just to clarify, when I say the velocity of the fluid, the fluid's doing different things at different points. When I say the particle's velocity is the fluid's velocity, I mean, yeah, at wherever it is that the particle happens to be at that moment. Right? So I, th I think this part in, that I have highlighted in purple, I think, is uh, pretty believable. Everybody, everybody buying it? All right, well, we can write this in algebra. Um, the velocity of the particle, well, we know position is x, so velocity is x prime. And the velocity of the fluid, I'm just going to momentarily call that v for velocity of the, of, uh, the fluid. And uh, then, of course, uh, evaluated where, evaluated at the point where the particle actually is. So, again, all, this equation up here is nothing more than just a an algebraic representation of this highly intuitive bit of language down here. Uh, and then we make the observation, so you're going to have to zoom back, uh, make the observation that we've already agreed that the velocity of the fluid is our vector field. And altogether then, um, <clears throat> having made that observation, all of this you know, it's kind of geometric physical intuition gives us this differential equation right here. In fact, this is what we call a system of differential equations because these are, this is a vector equation. 
X prime has several coordinates, two, maybe three coordinates. F being a vector field describing a fluid flowing in space um, has several coordinates likewise. So uh, that's uh, the differential equation, and if you can solve that differential equation, then uh, that solution, whatever that solution is, x, that's the parameterization of the path, and that's called a flow line. Everybody okay? All right, now how do we solve those differential equations? Uh, well, that's a topic for another course. Right, that's uh, a lot of y'all are engineers. You'll be taking Math 353 probably uh, after this, and uh, Math 353 will spend time talking about how to solve systems of differential equations, the whole thing. Right? It's uh, there's a lot to say about that. So even though we don't know how to solve them, we can confirm solutions. And so, for example, here's a here's an assertion. There's a vector field. By the way, you might recognize this vector field. But Related note to the related note. Um, it's a good idea to kind of have a short list of particularly notable and interesting vector fields that you could stand to reason would likely come up fairly often and just go ahead and remember <coughs> what they are, what they look like. Uh, so you could reason it through again, but uh, just as a reminder, this is a vector field that represents, uh, from your point of view, uh, a, uh, a sort of a stirred pot, as I like to say, there's a, uh, a kind of a mm, rotation of the fluid, if you will. That's what this represents. So um, <clears throat> the assertion being made is that uh, this is one of the flow lines. Um, so how are you going to confirm that this actually is? That don't worry about where we got that from, right? We're not solving the differential equation, but we're saying Here's a candidate solution. Let's check and see if it is a solution. And that's really not that hard to do. All you got to do is take the equation we were just talking about here. Remember that F is right there. right? And then just take our candidate, plug it in. Of course, it appears in the equation twice. You've got to take the derivative on the left, you plug into the vector field on the right, and then just see uh, that, uh, sure enough, the equation actually does work when you plug that in. It's very plug and chug. You can totally do it. Okay. All right. And by the way, this is, I'm going to say, a satisfying example in the following sense. We kind of knew right off the bat that this is the fluid is going around in circles and we've just confirmed that a particle at least some you know depending on where it starts moving around in circles as a result of the fluid moving around in circles so good right that should have worked yes um, what part of the equation uh, made, made the, the swap in x and y uh, oh you're talking about uh, this right here yeah. yeah, so this is just a, this is a vector field we talked about uh, several pages back, um, and um, the short version is that the field vector is a rotation of the position vector, uh, and that that's what makes the vector field represent something that's kind of going around in a circle. Yeah, you, so there's a long discussion of that back there, yeah. Okay. Right. Okay. So, uh, yeah, so uh, last thought before we go on to the next uh, section. And at this stage of learning about vector fields, a lot of students make a mistake. And this is a really important conceptual mistake, uh, kind of strategic slash conceptual mistake. A lot of students think, okay, so we've got these two different points of view on vector fields. I could think of them as kind of, you know, I could use kind of a uh, fluid flow metaphor to, to visualize what vector fields represent. Or I've also got, as a candidate, this, you know, force fields uh, point of view, like gravitational fields, electric fields, things like that. Uh, and some students find one or the other of these to be more intuitively satisfying, a little bit more relatable, something like that. So uh, it's fine, of course, to find something a little bit more natural than something else, 
right? But just so you know, you're going to need to be able to be uh, good at both of these, right? Both of these are going to be important. Um, uh, there's stuff that we're going to do in chapters 6 and 7 where you really unavoidably have to think of the vector field as representing forces. There's just, that's what it is. That's what, that's what you have to do. And there are other things that we're going to do in chapter 6 and 7 that just unavoidably you have to think about them in terms of fluids. So please make a point, conscious point in your mind right now. Don't pick. Right? Don't just sort of decide that you're going to be one kind of person or the other kind of person. Right? You're going to have to be both kinds. Okay. All right. Okay, moving along. 3.4. This is a weird section. Um, there is a good argument to be made that this section is highly premature. There is a case to be made that this is uh, arguably Chapter 7. Uh, so why are we doing it in chapter three? And uh, the uh, the short answer is because the book does. Uh, but okay, so why does the book do this in chapter three? And there is actually a really good reason. Um, we're going to be doing a bunch of stuff in chapter six and seven. This is mostly about seven. Um, that uh, it's really hard to digest the all of the geometric points of view on certain things that we're going to be doing. Um, and so the, the sort of pedagogical point of view on introducing some of these ideas here and now is so that those ideas can get planted and can start kind of settling in in your mind. And then when we get to them and do a much more careful development of all of this stuff in Chapter 6 and 7, mostly 7, um, you'll kind of be building on a foundation of uh, some intuition that you've already had a chance to kind of get used to. So uh, that's, uh, that's the story. And uh, with that said, uh, here we go. Uh, let's see here. We're going to uh, first revisit the gradient operator. All right, so this is the, uh, the gradient of a function. Um, and uh, we've written that down. Fine, just notation, whatever. Here's the, a slight rewrite of it. And now this might seem a little weird. But, uh, I mean, if you were to see somebody write this in a math book, you'd probably guess, you know, what could they have meant by this? Well, okay, I guess this, I mean, it's like F is, I mean, F is not really multiplying by, right? And this isn't really a vector, right? But uh, presumably by this, the writer meant this, right? It seemed like a reasonable... Sort of, uh, yeah. All right. And then, with that observation having been made, you could say, all right, well, it's like this thing by itself, this little triangle, not del f, but just the del itself, by itself, is this thing right here. And this is what we call a differential operator. Uh, so uh, this thing by itself, we're going to call it the del operator, if I hadn't already called it that previously, which I think I, I, think I have. Um, <clears throat> yeah, this is going to be, we're going to think of this as being a thing on its own. Now, a couple of disclaimers. Yeah, it's not really a vector. We're drawing it as if it's a vector. It's not a vector. That's total nonsense. And this is not our first time to write down what is technically total nonsense because it's super convenient, right? So uh, another case in point. So again, we call this a symbolic vector because it's not actually a vector, and that's our sort of confession of that. But uh, man, it's handy uh, to write things in this way. Okay, so there's that. Uh, please make sure of one thing. Please do not call this gradient. It is not gradient. This is not gradient. You get the gradient if you apply it in this way. That's the gradient, right? But this thing by itself is going to be used for various different operators, all of which are important and not all of which are gradient. So you've got to be really careful with that. It's not the gradient, so be careful. 
Okay, all right, first example. Um, by the way, the, uh, just so you know, uh, this, uh, what I'm about to do here uh, makes me very uncomfortable because I really, I mean, as a mathematician, you like to start with fundamentals and reason to conclusions. And in fact, I was thinking about that. You've heard me say this before. That's what this course is about. It's about reasoning, not conclusions, right? So I think that's, in fact, one of the important takeaways of the class, right? If I had to choose one fundamental idea that 20 years from now you all still remember, I think that would be it, that reasoning is the most important thing, right? The conclusion you come to, well, yeah, dude, the whole point to reasoning is that so that you can know that you're right with your conclusions, right? But the point being then that the reasoning is the thing. The reasoning comes first. Right? So anyway, very important. And, and, and I can't do it here. Uh, this is, again, super frustrating for me. I, I'm about to tell you some facts that I don't have anywhere near enough ideas established in the course to be able to give you a reasonable justification. It gives me the willies, right? So anyway, that having been said, uh, here we go. Uh, and again, the, the goal here is to plant certain thoughts, get certain ideas percolating right, in your brain, settling in so you can get comfortable with them, uh, and then uh, we'll, we'll do more careful discussions later. All right, so here we go. All right, so there's this thing called divergence the divergence of a vector field. Here's the formula for the divergence of a vector field. Um, here I'm writing uh, only for three-dimensional vector fields, but uh, likewise, if you have more or fewer coordinates, it's exactly what you would extrapolate from this formula. Um, and uh, we're gonna say a bunch of stuff about divergence, really important in the course, most of it later. Um, but uh, the observation I'm gonna make here, first observation I'm gonna make here is that if you were to take the del operator and the vector field, keeping in mind the vector field has those coordinates, and if you were to do a dot product, well, I mean, okay, first of all, bogus. Del is not a vector. Dot product, something you do with two vectors. Del is not a vector. It's all nonsense. <laughs> so just to be clear, right? Um, but again, convenient, really convenient nonsense. So even though we kind of, yeah, okay, you can't really do that. If you were to proceed anyway, you would think, all right, well, I guess I'm going to apply the three different coordinates, if you will, uh, of the del operator to the three different coordinates of the vector field. I mean, that's a reasonable best guess as to what this kind of nonsensical dot product ought to mean. Yeah? So what we have then really is a very handy alternative notation for divergence. And now again, we haven't talked yet about what divergence means or why we care about it or what it looks like. All that's going to come later. I'm going to scratch the surface in a couple of minutes here. But uh, uh, right now I just want to establish that that is a reasonable notation for divergence. And by the way, this is not me on a uh, notational personal you know, uh, uh, soapbox kind of, uh, you know, pet peeve sort of thing. This is an extremely common notation. This is all over the place. And in fact, in my, when I was taking physics classes way back when, I saw this notation primarily. So I think this is what y'all are probably going to see primarily when, uh, as a notation for divergence. This is why it makes sense. Okay. Okay, so what is this divergence, and again, this is where I give myself the willies, uh, divergence with no justification at all. <laughs> this thing called divergence represents the amount a fluid is flowing outward away from the vicinity of X, wherever it is you're evaluating. It represents sort of a outward flow if you will, whatever that means. Okay, so now I'm going to show you some examples just to kind of flesh out, you know, the intuition that you're supposed to take from this. 
And uh, so here we go. Uh, here is a vector field, and you can compute the divergence. Uh, blah, blah, blah. You get a positive value. And <clears throat> does this track with what the vector field looks like? Well, there's our vector field. By the way, again, make sure you're comfortable with why this is what the vector field looks like. Remember the big idea? This isn't exactly what we looked at previously, but very similar to what we looked at previously. The field vector is the position vector for the point that you're evaluating. So you get this kind of, this kind of outward uh, this outward flow, kind of like that. Okay. So, um, did it work? Did divergence do as promised? I say that it did. The claim was that divergence represents outward flow, and yeah, that's yeah. See, that's what's. I mean, that's what we're seeing in this picture: positive divergence, outward flow. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Well, it, I mean, it turns out that we're plugging in the zero vector into a formula that's just a constant, and so it doesn't matter, okay. right? The reason I specify that the origin specifically is just because I wanted to have the, I wanted to be able to talk about just for intuitional convenience that yeah, check it out, see it's flowing outward away from that point. Now it turns out, and you know, the subtext of your question is that, well, yeah, but it's three at other points also. And so, believe it or not, it's hard to tell from this picture, but points, let's say, over here, yeah, in fact, and we'll be able to make this precise later on, there's actually a net outward flow from these points also. Uh, yeah. So, again, that's, that's uh, chapter six and seven stuff. Okay. So this is uh, the, the standard classical first example of divergence. <coughs> and now I do want to bring up the question of physical intuition. You know, what does this represent physically? And uh, there's a, a point of confusion on this. Um, there are different, qualitatively different, physical metaphors that would totally be represented by this little vector field, this story. So, um, <clears throat> so for, as a first example, uh, l let's imagine that there's some tall tree, like a palm tree or something, and up at the very, very, very top of the palm tree, uh, you know, in that one, basically one spot up there where the fronds are, right? Um, there's a bunch of birds, right? And then uh, something happens, and the birds all get scared, and the birds start to fly outward away. Some of them fly up, some of them fly down, some to the left, some to the right. Uh, they're just every which direction, but all from that one point. The flow of those birds evacuating out of the tree would look, eh, you know, vaguely, approximately anyway, something kind of like this. Right? So there's a temptation to say, aha, cool. So when I see positive divergence, when I see a vector field that looks like that, where there's a positive outward flow, then that means that whatever the fluid is, is evacuating the vicinity. And if you think about it, if there's a certain amount of fluid and then it starts leaving, then the amount of fluid remaining would be decreasing. Right? If you've got stuff and you're losing stuff, then you're getting less stuff. Right? So uh, uh, there's a temptation <coughs> to associate a positive divergence with a uh, decreasing density of stuff. And that is one of the two possibilities? Sure, that might be it. But I think it's important to recognize there's another possibility. And so I'm going to give you now a different physical metaphor. Uh, for what might be going on, what this vector field might represent, what this divergence might represent. Imagine that this is not uh, where there's a bunch of birds huddled together. Imagine that this is a light bulb. Well, there was a light bulb. There'd be a bunch of photons instead of birds, but flowing outward, again, not unlike this. Right? When you have a light bulb... Are you, are you losing photons when, when you turn on the light bulb? No, not at all. It's not like light bulbs have a finite supply of photons that uh, as it shoots them out, then it has less and less photons. That's not at all what's going on. It's generating 
photons. Right? So this positive divergence might, depending on the situation, it might represent not a rate of losing fluid density, it might be a rate of creating fluid. Right? Everybody on board? Totally different physical metaphor. Right? Qualitatively different scenario. So you got to keep that in mind. You know, when you're trying to visualize, uh, okay, so this uh, looks like that, and you know, so what does that mean physically? What do I conclude from this? Be careful. There's two possibilities. And by the way, just to make it a little bit more complicated, sometimes both of these are happening to different degrees. And you can entertain yourself by trying to imagine what would be this scenario where, <laughs> where uh, both of these are happening at the same time. That's weird. How would that work? And if you're curious, come talk to me in office hours. I'll be happy to discuss, uh, you know, some uh, some uh, uh, you know ultimately natural examples of both of these happening at the same time. Okay. All right. Okay. So um, here's another example. Again, make sure you're good at understanding how to draw vector fields. So here's another example. Make sure you can do that. Right. Oh, yeah, question. Uh, I had a question about the previous diagram. Yep. Uh, what does the number three actually mean? Is it like how much volume yeah, do we need? Yeah, I, I hear you. No, it, it's, um, the, I'm going to have to wait until later. Right. And um, later I'll be able to give you a crisper answer to that question. But even then, I'm going to be a little bit mm, sloppy about it. Not sloppy, it's wrong. I would be non-specific about certain things because the vector field could represent the fluid in various different ways and we could be using various different units and again various different physical interpretations so there is no single crisp always exactly this one thing answer to the question um, uh, but uh, one way or the other bigger numbers means more outward flow Smaller numbers means less outward flow. Negative numbers would mean inward flow. Does that make sense? Yeah, we're never going to be asked to like interpret more than that. No, 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 no. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That we don't have the the. Yeah, we don't. All right, if you're asked, if I'm going to ask you for anything that would require a more specific interpretation, I would have to set things up and and be explicit about how what that interpretation would. And I think I do have a homework exercise where I do that. Um, but, uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, so, again, vector field picture. Make sure you can do that. Um, good exercise to think about. Make sure to persuade yourself of that. Uh, you can compute the divergence. Uh, you get zero. Now, what is the takeaway? All right, what is it? How, how should I be satisfied? with the suggestion that the divergence is zero here. And the idea is, now I did this at, uh, you'll notice, arbitrary point A. I'm not specifying specifically that we're looking at the origin. So, okay, um, how should I be content with the idea that in this vicinity that there is no outward flow? And uh, <clears throat> my uh, answer to that would be, well, to just kind of look at it, uh, notice that, in fact, there is an outward flow, but there's also an inward flow. And, uh, you know, again, just kind of a geometric intuition, doesn't it appear that there's just as much in as there is out? Right? And, in fact, this is the confirmation of that. The fact that the divergence is zero confirms that there's just as much inward as there is outward. So it's not quite right to say that we're talking about outward flow. The outward flow doesn't have to be uniform like it was in this example. Right? Um, sometimes we have a scenario where there's both outward and inward at the same time, and divergence should be understood as kind of net outward flow. <clears throat> Inward counts as negative, outward counts as positive. These effectively cancel each other and give you a total of zero. Okay. All right. Next. Definition that I need to make highly prematurely, about which I'm going to make a, in this context, baseless assertion that 
again, makes me very uncomfortable. Uh, it's going to leave you all wondering where on earth did that come from. And again, I'm sorry, and I don't like having to do that. But again, the textbook uh, is doing it this way, again, for good reasons, to plant thoughts, to let ideas start percolating. Right? Uh, so uh, anyway, here we are. Um, <clears throat> if you have a vector field, uh, whoops, get back into the highlighter mode. You have a vector field, F. Uh, you have this del operator. And instead of dotting them, you could cross them. Again, weird. Again, suspicious. Can you do that? Is that legal? Uh, well, I, I mean, again, not really. <laughs> right? Again, del is not a vector. This is a little bit bogus. But again, if you set that aside, except that this is symbolic shorthand convenience, and don't forget that when we do a cross product, right, the, the, the idea of cross product is cross product means we're going to take the determinant of the matrix that you get when you <coughs> do like that, and the first vector, such as it is, uh, goes there. The second vector goes there. That's, that's what a cross product is. But if you just do that, then uh, this resulting thing... Uh, it's what's called curl. And again, I, we don't have the the, uh, uh, the the necessary setup to be able to make sense out of this. I'm just going to assert what this represents. It turns out this is a really important mathematical object, uh, this thing called curl. Uh, and here's what it is. Again, very loosely, very sort of hand-wavy. Um, we have to recognize that when you have a three-dimensional fluid, oh, and no, by the way, notice I didn't say in here anything about, uh, you know, likewise for other dimensions. Nope. This is three-dimensional spe specifically. Only, oh, excuse me, only three-dimensional. And by the way, of course, because cross product as a binary operation is only three-dimensional. Yes? Would this be like the same thing? Yeah, it, it, there's a, it, it's very, it makes, it helps us make sense out of vortices, yeah, absolutely. Yep, yep, yep. And we're going to see an example that, that exactly illustrates that, yep. Okay, so yeah, three-dimensional only. Um, so uh, yeah, the claim here that I'm going to assert without any context, without any justification, um, is that we have a vector field. Lots of things can happen as the fluid flows around the vector field. And one thing that can happen is there could be a sort of a rotational aspect to the fluid. That's a possibility. Right? Just as another example, I remember we talked about leaves dropping down onto the surface of a creek, and the leaves go wherever the creek goes. Right? They follow the water. That's they have to. Well, you probably even noticed this at some point, or you might have noticed it. If not, I encourage you to look out for the following. Next time you're standing next to a creek and there's, you know, it's the fall and the leaves of, you know, down there and they're flowing, the, you know, leaves flowing downstream, notice they're turning. Right? And that's because on the surface of the water, while in addition to flowing downstream, right, the water also has a certain amount of a rotational aspect. So if you have a fluid that has a rotational aspect to it, curl tells you, again, very loosely, I don't want to get into units, uh, so many different situations, they'd all be different. Curl represents um, how much and around what axis there is a rotation of the fluid. And I use the term here, circulates. You notice I put circulates in quotes. That's, that's me confessing that I haven't defined this yet. <laughs> right? Well, this, again, that's a chapter six or seven. I think it's chapter six. Uh, one or the other. Anyway, much later thing. Okay. Um, but uh, precision aside, curl tells you how much and around what axis is there a rotation of the fluid. Okay. Again, no justification given. But let's see an example of this. Um, here we uh, again have a vector field. Again, make sure you can draw this picture. Uh, this is another nice little exercise. Um, now you'll notice it's kind of going around 
sort of counterclockwise in a circle, a lot like the vector field we talked about earlier, which was f of x comma y equals negative y comma x. What I have in dark blue there, we've already talked about, and we've got a picture that looks a lot like this. So all you have to do is persuade yourself uh, what happens when you introduce a third coordinate, and specifically that in doing so, you're also going to keep the vertical component of the field vector zero. And what I claim that you get is basically a, um, uh, this is more like a three-dimensional stirred pot, right? This is a, literally we have an actual bucket of water that has height to it, and it's been sort of stirred like this. Is that cool? All right. So, again, make sure you can persuade yourself of that. And if I were to take that vector field and compute uh, del cross, in other words, compute the curl of that vector field like so, then you get this. And I claim that this is uh, kind of what my, predict or my claim predicted because that says that the curl is like this. And notice, um, this fluid is rotating around that axis. Everybody on board? Now, then there's the question of the magnitude. Yeah, what's the, what's the deal with the two? Yeah, okay, right, well, so, yeah, gosh. It would depend on the units and the context, and uh, we, uh, that's, that's details that, for another course, right? Uh, uh, too many different scenarios to worry about, and that's just not what we're here for. Uh, but uh, again, generally, the rule is the bigger the curl vector, the longer, the greater the magnitude of the curl vector, and in some sense, the more rotation there is, as opposed to less rotation. The longer the curl vector, the stronger the tornado. Yes? Oh, yeah, I mean, yeah, calculating the magnitude of the curl is just computation, right? Um, interpreting that as something physical and having an answer with units is, is what I just, I don't, that's not our thing. Does that make sense? Yeah. Are you, are you happy with that? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Okay, so uh, a couple more examples I want to show you. Uh, one, uh, I want to show you an example of where there is no... Uh, curl at all. So again, vector field, again, picture, again, make sure you can do that. Make sure you can persuade yourself that that's what this looks like. Um, <clears throat> and you can compute the curl and you get zero as it turns out, which suggests that there is no rotation happening in this fluid at all. And I, you know, I got to tell you, I think that, I think that's pretty intuitively satisfying, right? I mean, where's the rotation? I don't see any rotation in any of any sort in this picture. So again, good, right? Curl does what I've claimed it does again. Okay, now here's the weird one. This is very counterintuitive. And by the way, there is a homework exercise based on uh, the phenomenon that I'm about to show you in this example right here. This one seems to fail. Um, but it doesn't. But it seems like it does. So again, vector field, picture, make sure you can do that. Okay. Um, compute the curl. You get a downward vector. And um, that would seem to suggest that there is a clockwise rotation happening. Now let me tell you why it looks bad. It looks like we've failed because you can see the field vectors. You can therefore see the flow lines and check it out. These flow lines are all straight lines. And that's true. Those flow lines are all straight lines. So there's a temptation to say, okay, well, what gives? It doesn't, I don't see any circles here. 
curl supposed to isn't that supposed to suggest the fluid rotating? Uh, um, where's the rotation in this picture? Does everybody see why this is, looks like a bad looks like a counterexample? Right? Not. Uh, <laughs> this gets into uh, what I uh, said back here about uh, I have uh, been carefully ambiguous about what I mean by circulation. Okay, so what we have here is not a counterexample. What we have here is an instructional example of how not to interpret rotation of the fluid. Rotation <coughs> of the fluid has nothing to do with flow lines. It's just not about flow lines. It's about something very similar, but importantly different. And here's, uh, here's what I'm going to suggest. Think about, and let's get rid of the curl here for an example. Um, what if I were to drop a leaf right there? What do you think would happen to that leaf? Now, here's the thing. The uh, leaf is being pushed that way on that side, and it's being pushed that way on that side, isn't it? And, you know, I mean, again, just think about uh, your physical intuition. If you have something like this and you push it oh, you know forward on the left and backwards on the right or however you um, have yourself you know oriented in this picture you'd probably expect it to rotate wouldn't you that seem reasonable so in fact there is a rotation in this fluid it's just not evident in the flow lines flow lines aren't the point don't get distracted by flow lines um, one of the reasons you might be thinking in terms of flow lines is because this classical first example has flow lines that are circles. So that just kind of gets you thinking that this is the rotation that we're talking about, and it's not. It's something I'm going to define precisely later, right? But the best intuition you can have uh, for you know what we're talking about here is not the flow lines themselves, but if you were to drop a leaf into there or some floating sub whatever into there, how would that thing rotate as as sort of pushed by the by the fluid? Does that make sense to everybody? Everybody see the difference there? Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right, so that's curl. Um, <clears throat> this last bit that I'm going to talk about is really just, uh, I just, my, my goal here is to raise some eyebrows. That's, that's really my primary goal. Uh, we're not going to, don't think of this as where we're learning material. All the ideas that are in here are ideas that we are going to talk about in much greater detail in chapter six and seven. Uh, by the way, also don't look in the book for what I'm about to tell you here because it's not there. This is my own kind of personal take on uh, how to think about this stuff. But um, I, I, I want to I try to persuade you or at least get you open to the idea that there may be some deep water uh, that we're currently sailing over. So I want to, again, raise some eyebrows and get you wondering, hey, whoa, that's weird. What's going on here? There's, uh, there's, there's big ideas afoot here. So... Um, I'm just going to make the observation that if you take your gradient, uh, whoops, wrong form. If you take your gradient operator, gradient turns scalar value functions into vector fields. Okay? And then if you take your curl operator that we just defined, and of course that turns vector fields into other vector fields. And then if you take your divergence operator, which again, we just defined, and divergence will turn a vector field into a scalar value function. I claim that if you compose these operators in exactly that way, amazing things happen. Stuff that you, no one would have guessed based on the formulas. Stuff that no one, well, anyway, that it's hard to see it coming from the point of view of these geometric intuitions we've talked about. Gradients about how functions, uh, you know, what's, what direction is uphill. Curl is about this nebulously ex described thing I'm calling circulation, right? Divergence is about outward flow. These seem to be about totally different things. 
and yet amazing things happen when you compose these operators like this. Uh, so in particular, you get something called an exact sequence, the short version of which is that all lifetimes are two, by which I mean, for example, if you have a vector field and you take the curl, the result will be another vector field, which when you take the divergence, you will get zero. And I, I use zero. This, is, this, this lifetime metaphor is my own little creation, little dark metaphor, but uh, zero is death. In this metaphors, if you will. Yeah, question. Does the order in which those operations have to matter? Yes, it's very, very, very important. It's got to be exactly this order. Yes, absolutely. So I claim that this always happens. Everything has a lifetime of two, um, and I mean lifetime in the sense that this is birth and then survival and then death. Uh, everything has a lifetime of two with some precious counterexamples. Um, but uh, so if you have a function and you take the gradient, and then you take the curl of that, you get zero. And furthermore, if you have a vector field, if you take the curl, and if you get zero, could that initial vector field that I was looking at, could that have been where it was born? No, because then it would not have a lifetime of two. Now it would have a lifetime of one, and that's not how that works. Everything's got a lifetime of two. So when this happens, that means that there is a function whose gradient is that initial vector field. And the lifetime is two. It's weird, right? That this happens everywhere in the, this little diagram. And again, my goal here was just to raise some eyebrows to get you thinking, whoa, spooky, there must be some really interesting underlying facts, and we're going to see some of that in Chapter 7. Y'all have a good weekend. See you later.